An ocean crossing has been on my bucket list. Just always wanted to do a ocean crossing before the end of my day. I started sailing early high school. We've done a lot of bareboat charters, Belize, Sea of Cortez, Bahamas, Virgin Islands, different parts of the world. When I was working in Hawaii, bought Slow Motion 2. Didn't really want to sell it when I left Hawaii, so Dan and I thought if we got it to the West Coast, we'd keep using it. My dad used to say when people are on their deathbed, they don't regret the things that they did so much, but regret the things they didn't do. I definitely wouldn't have done it if it wasn't you know, with my dad. And having the opportunity to undertake an adventure like that, couldn't pass it up. As far as the crew goes, I mean, we had kind of kicked around with a number of different people, but really settled on a guy that had done some crossings before, was a very experienced sailor. His mechanical abilities and his sailing experience brought a calmness to the boat that probably wouldn't have been there without him. A lady that spent quite a bit of time on boats fishing. Pam had never been sailing, and hats off to her for the courage to, to do that. Dan and his technical abilities certainly had us all plumbed in. Couldn't have asked for a better mix of personalities, sailing experience, and technical skills. You're kind of sailing off into the great unknown. You don't know what the weather's going to do. There was another boat, we called it our sister boat, that was in the same marina and going to the same marina in California. And we pulled out of the marina and Coalina side by side. Stayed in sight with them for the first 12 hours. It was nice to be able to talk to them and know somebody else that was kind of going through the same thing. When the sister boat had to turn around, we felt sympathy for them. Yeah, they had to turn around because one of their crew members got real sick. It wasn't a mechanical issue or anything. Being 180 nautical miles in front of them after four days, I was feeling pretty good about where we were. Just the general wetness of the waves and the humidity, you never really got dry. Even in the sunshiny, beautiful days, there was still enough humidity that it was damp, rougher than I anticipated. Certainly had the long nights and the long days. Sleep was a bigger issue than I thought it would be. The motion of the boat, the sound of the waves hitting the hulls. We did three hour shifts, so by the time you got done with your shift, undressed into your bunk, and then you had to get back up, you probably didn't really get two hours of being in the bunk. It's hard to get sleep like that, you do that day after day. You got to the point that you were just so tired, you slept. The anxiety along with the fatigue was probably the biggest challenge that I had. It was not knowing, you know, if everything was under control and if the boat was doing okay, that made it hard for me to sleep. It wasn't so much the waves and the wetness and cold as much as it was just kind of being on edge the whole time. I found it a lot easier for me to sleep during the day when there were three other people awake and I knew that if there was any issues, they'd be right there to deal with them. That put my mind at ease and made it easier for me to sleep. There were some tense moments when the winds and the waves were up. A little bit of discussion on what to do with sails and what the right strategy was for those high seas. We would go through these really heavy waves and take on a bunch of water uh, over the front of the boat. You know, later once it calmed down, you'd go up and walk around and you'd find squid on the boat. And to me it was like, wow, we're taking on so much water that we're taking on sea life on the boat. We got into days and days of these small sail jellyfish. It was unbelievable. It never went away for weeks at a time. And there were smells still that like we never figured out the source of. Our bunk smelled terrible and it wasn't just because Dad and I were sleeping in there without showering for days on end getting strong enough that it was actually permeating up into the boat. You'd open the hatch and you just had to hold your breath. Dad and I are hot bunking in this one. We're not going to sleep the same time. And there's Pam's bunk. There's Chris. Hi Chris. There's Chris's bunk. Kitchen. We're in the galley. Not going to get scurvy. In reach. Transmitting our position. There's our electronics. The water maker on board did a great job at make a bet. Oh, eight to 10 gallons an hour of good water. We bought a 30 day supply of freeze dried food that we would use when the weather was really too rough to cook.
I kind of uh, got a little tired of the type of food we were eating just because it was kind of that, you know, would keep for the whole month. And, um, you know, it's like tortillas and lunch meat and stuff like that that was good. I found myself really craving a salad. We had a full mix of the weather. We had flat seas, as flat as a swimming pool. We had some beautiful sailing days. We had some pretty rough stuff. It was a tougher trip than I had expected. I certainly got closer to the good Lord. I was praying for his guidance. I figured out that probably wasn't as tough as I thought I was. Probably not as accomplished a sailor as I thought I was. When you're 1,500 miles away from land, it's not like you can call the Coast Guard and they're gonna come get you. I question whether the boat was up to the test. We had a couple pretty mechanical structural issues. When the waves were in the 30 foot range and the wind was blowing 30 plus knots, I was concerned about the structural integrity of the boat. Having done a reasonable amount of sailing over my lifetime, I didn't expect to be as nervous as I was at times. Being away from people and being away from land was mitigated by the fact that we could communicate with our friends and family back home. I could text with people to find out what was just kind of going on in the news or um, you know, if I had a question that if I was back home, I would have Googled. Find that information out online and send it back to us. Well, Dan probably wished he'd have brought more books because he read 13 books to my zero. So I brought this big honking laptop, just this giant beast of a machine that I didn't use. When you're rocking and rolling and all that, it's a lot easier just to deal with an iPad than it is a big old computer. First time that we saw a boat, a container ship was coming back the other way. We picked them up on the radar and it tells you the size of the boat, and the direction they're heading and the speed and all that stuff. And so dad got on the radio and was like, this is slow motion, do you copy? And whoever was on the other end of the radio was like, okay, I see you. And so we're like, how's the weather coming from where you're at? It's like, okay, I see you. We saw this first boat and we're excited to talk to somebody and just kind of have that interaction. And there was a huge language barrier that we never got over. Yeah, the spooky thing about that is when he finally figured out where we were, we were off his fork stern. So we saw him 15 miles out. He didn't see us till we'd actually already passed. And with autopilot, with the radar and all these things that we have today, respect for the sailors. 300 years ago. Dan wanted to get a picture of all of us with his GoPro from the top of the mast. So just getting that rigged up and getting it up and down and getting it unstuck. We ended up catching four fish. And they were good sized tuna. They were a little challenging to clean on the back of the boat when you're bouncing around. It's amazing how tuna and spam actually complement each other. Exactly. The highlight for me was a full moon and was super bright, but then on the other side of the boat was a little bit of a storm and some rain. And so it actually cast a grayscale rainbow. That was just kind of like, am I hallucinating? My calculations and talking to some of the folks, we expected 16 to 18 day trip. Unfortunately, there was an anomaly this summer. The high pressure kept moving north. So our plan was to sail to latitude 34, 35. And because the high was moving north, we couldn't get turned east until we got to latitude 41. That's 600 miles further north we had to go. And there was actually discussion about just going to Alaska. We kind of went into it with a very specific plan from a sailing perspective and how long it was going to take and, and things just, they don't always work out the way that you anticipate it. From a mental preparation perspective, that could be hard unless you're ready for that. Here we are in Southern California where it's like 60 degrees and you can't see anything. Uh, there's seals over the shoulder there. Getting closer to them. Look at them! And I was ready to get home to drier weather. Of course, getting back to my family, my wife and my dog. And you know, I was excited to get back to work. The highlight of the trip for me was probably just getting there. We essentially went 22 days without seeing land. Woo, Dad, what do you think? We made it. Yay, Yay Chris. We pulled into the marina with one can of beer left. <laughs> I mean, I know that you like held on to the one can for when we got there, but at one point you were drinking monster energy drinks. 
You know, we were so tired and so relieved to get there. And we're close to land. Civilization, Channel Islands Harbor. Leaving in a couple of hours. What did you do to, to actually celebrate? Got on an airplane. Yeah, we have yet to celebrate. We need to find some time to actually do that because I don't know, we probably should take time out to celebrate it. I learned about what was important to me in my life because I had a lot of time to think about that. Like any challenge you go through, you come out stronger. I'm a stronger individual because of the trip that we made and the challenges that went with it. The oceans running your show.